Capital Partner. Katie, I'm going to turn it over to you and Kevin. Good morning. Perfect. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Katie Berganti. Uh, joining me is Kevin Karani. He's our Director of Institutional. And uh, we're actually really excited to be here. Uh, Clearwater Capital Partners, we're an independent registered investment advisor. We, um, we are located in Hoffman Estates, actually. I'm not used to flipping it over so quickly. Um, we're located here in Hoffman Estates. Um, we are privately held, locally owned, and um, we, we have some really great reach. We're in 33 states. We also have an international presence, and we have over a billion dollars in assets under management. And the reason why we're here today um, sponsoring what we feel is a really great fit, and I think somebody needs to be, there you go, admitted, um, why we feel like this is a really great fit is when you're talking about the war on talent, um, you know, there are very specific things that uh, candidates look for out of their next company. And 401k is one of those um, high demand components of benefits that, that uh, prospective employees and can, uh, your current employees really want to make sure that they have the, the best of the best at their fingertips. And, and, and what does that mean? And do you know that you have it? Um, so we're going to have a short little dialogue on that. Um, but uh, what are you pointing at? I can just talk about this so we don't, oh. we don't take a long time. So Good. as Katie said, and, and thank you for letting us be a part of this conversation this morning. What a great fit for what we do. But I think what makes us different, and I, we won't bore you with all the fiduciary talk like we normally say, but that is a big part about who we are and what we do. And I think a lot of you people on the call today could appreciate that because probably at some point in your careers or right now, you have some sort of involvement with your employee benefit plans and or the 401k plan. And where I think we fit in is, you know, these three little points on the side, how we're very transparent in what we do. We're very open about what we do. We're not... Um, you know, beholden to specific fund companies or whatever, we can fill um, what's really best for the company and the plan and the plan sponsors and ultimately the plan participants. And, and why that's so important is that the Department of Labor says, if you want to sponsor a qualified plan, you need to carry out these five fiduciary responsibilities. And that's a, that's a big thing that oftentimes people don't understand and they take for granted. And that's where we really come in that last point down there to carry out all your duties as a prudent expert would that's where we come alongside plan sponsors or HR professionals um, to really make sure that you can create the best plan for your participants. After all, that's what we're here to try to do, win the war on talent. But at the same time, check all the boxes that the Department of Labor says they have to do. And that's a tall order oftentimes. So on our role as a co-fiduciary, there's that big fiduciary word. Uh, we really enjoy coming alongside, just make sure we can help um, a participant plan sponsors really win the war. So as I said, happy to be a part of this discussion today. Uh, it's really kind of right up our alley. We just got done hiring two new people. So we totally understand how difficult it is in this market to hire qualified talent. So as I said, just happy to be a part of this conversation. So thanks for the time this morning. Thank you. Thanks, Katie and Kevin. Uh, today, I'm excited to introduce you guys uh, to our speakers. I didn't even do an introduction for myself. I'm so sorry. I'm like so excited about this topic because it's near and dear to me with what's going on in the world. I'm Katie Dykstra. I'm the NHRC VP, and I'm excited to have Shaker here today. I have Megan Tracy and Christina Pickle, um, and they are involved with TA branding, TA marketing. And so they have some great knowledge to share with us today of what's going on in the workforce and how we can battle this. So the war on talent. Uh, ladies, take it away. Hi everyone, let me share my screen real quickly. All right. Can everybody see my screen? We can. All right, well, thank you. Thanks for having us join today. My name is Christina Pickle and I'm a VP of Client Service at Shaker Recruitment Marketing. I've uh, been in this industry most of my adult life. I started out as a recruiter working in transportation and then I moved over to the agency side about 20 years ago, uh, working for big uh, agencies. I joined Shaker about three years ago. And so we work with clients to really help them get their employer brand out into the marketplace, work on strategies in terms of how to recruit talent, 
uh, and really give them the best candidate experience. And so we're gonna uh, touch on a few of those topics today, but before we do that, I'll introduce you to Megan Tracy. Hi there, everybody. My name's Megan Tracy. I'm the Vice President of Global Relations at Shaker. Um, I've been at Shaker for 11 years, but I've been in the business my entire adult life. So, um, and I have been on the agency side my entire adult life. So, you know, helping helping our clients, you know, really strategize, develop uh, media plans, employer brands, candidate experiences, and so forth. Um, and we're, Christina and I are super excited to, to play tag team today and talk to you guys a little bit about um, not just the war on talent, but trends that can really help solve for, you know, filling your funnel with more candidates. So, uh, Christina, awesome. Um, so this is probably something that you all probably already know, but um, we have, uh, in August, there were about 10.1 million um, jobs uh, open um, in the United States. And you can see from this chart in January of 2002, they were at 5 million. So you could see, you know, just sort of the trends of, you know, pretty much rising the whole entire time, but then totally spiking um, since uh, since the, the, the heart of the pandemic. I actually just saw this morning that it looks like it's going to inch closer to 11 million by the end of September. So um, we really, you know, sort of are, um, you know, in dire straits here because the, um, the, the talent, the um, labor force, their activity has been flat. So everything is going up with job openings, but the, but the labor market's remaining flat, which is really puts us all in sort of a precarious situation. So, so what does it mean, right? It means that your jobs and your job descriptions and, um, you know, everything associated with it, your employment, you know, or offering employment to people really needs to be more attractive. You need to stand out and you need to be different and you need to move quickly. Um, so there are, there are a lot of different um, techniques you can use. Um, the, the Clearwater Partners had an excellent point. You know, benefits are a really important piece of this as well. It's not really Christina and uh, my sweet spot because we're more on the marketing side, but certainly that's a really important piece of it as well. So something to, to keep in mind there about what you offer your employees um, is, is, is a really big factor as well. Um, and then, so when, when talking about trends and what we can do, um, we talk about the EVP and the employer brand development. So your EVP, which is your employee value proposition, it really is the promise that you make to employees, the lived experience of where, you, of your culture, of what it's like to work there. Um, we typically will do this through um, research. We will articulate this through um, qualitative and quantitative research. And it's really important that this is authentic because, you know, back in the old days when Christina and I started, you could just, you know, make a promise and people will apply for your job and then, you know, whatever they say. That's, that's not really how it works anymore. If the promise made is not the promise kept, you are going to have attrition and that is not what you want. So, um, so the EVP, it, it needs to be authentic. Um, once we have that defined and we can build out an employer brand, which is really um, what people recognize as your company as an employer. So, um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, enhanced uh, candidate experience. So when, you know, actually Glassdoor says that 18 touch points are, are what candidates review before they apply for a job. So you want to make sure that that, that that candidate experience, everything that they um, they touch is, you know, consistent, but also easy, smart, that the content that's being served up to them is what they're looking for. And then is it easy to apply for a job? Does it make, um, you know, does your apply process make sense? Does your onboarding make sense? All of this is part of the candidate experience. Um, investment in TA technology, it's like a $5 billion industry, TA technology. And, um, you know, you just need to make sure that you're utilizing technology to improve your overall candidate experience. So that's something that we'll also talk about. And then modernizing the recruitment marketing strategy. Um, so, you know, as, as Christina and I said, we've been in this business for a really long time. And back in the old days, we used to just place a help wanted ad in the <laughs> Sunday Chicago Tribune and and people would, you know, fax in their resumes or send in their resumes, and then you would make some hires. Well, obviously, we've ushered the, that, you know, ushered our clients from, you know, print 
to online. So then we had all those monster and career builder contracts. And then we're doing um, uh, the aggregators like Indeed. Um, now we're doing programmatic advertising. We're doing social media pay-per-click. We're doing um, a whole bunch of different types of things. And we're going we're gonna to talk about that as well. Right. So I thought it would be helpful to show through example. And I'm going to show you some work that we do for one of our clients, the Wendy's company. Um, the one thing I do want to say is I know that some of your organizations are not big. You may be a one man show. Um, a lot of this that we're going to show, you don't have to have huge budgets, right, in order to implement a lot of these strategies. And um, so the case study I'm going to show you is Wendy's. They are a big organization, um, but they're a complex organization. So they have a corporate office, which sits in Dublin, Ohio, where they have their corporate hires. Um, and then they, they own, they're in six markets, and they have about 300 uh, corporate owned restaurants, but the rest of it's franchise. So the other 6,000, they have their own ATS, their own benefits, their own uh, Canon experience. And so when uh, we started working with Wendy's, we had to come up with a brand that was authentic and that really uh, was true to the company as a system, right? Not just as the company branded stores. And so we did do some research. Um, they did invest in some research, but really the themes came out of their own data. So, you know, if you do with your companies, if you have employee engagement surveys, exit interviews, informal conversations, uh, you can hold your own focus groups to really understand what it is about your organization that makes you unique and helps you stand apart from your competitors. What's interesting too in this market is your competitors today are not just the people who work in your space, right? So for Wendy's, it's not just Taco Bell and Chick-fil-A and, and so forth. Um, you know, it's the Amazons, <clears throat> you know, those uh, Walmart, right? And so it's not just uh, the quick uh, serve restaurant uh, who we compete against uh, for talent. So as we were kind of looking at all of that data, some themes came across, right? And they survey all of the employees. They survey all of the restaurant crew. And this whole initiative really started because they were gonna roll out breakfast and they needed to make 20,000 hires. And you know, when we looked at the competition, Taco Bell had scholarships that they offered and Walmart had all these great benefits and Wendy's just did not offer that as a system. So the themes that we landed on were it was a fun, it's a fun place to work. Their Ooh, culture okay. is very fun and playful. Um, flexibility is huge when you look at this talent. Um, you know, when we were looking to make these 20,000 hires around the breakfast uh, initiative, we couldn't go for high school students, right? They're in school. And even when you look at the makeup of fast food these days, it's not the teenager, maybe in the summer it is, but you know, during when the kids are in school, their average age workforce is between 20 to 40 years old. So, um, you know, it's the working parent, it's someone who's looking for a side gig, right? They might be driving an Uber and they're looking for to make some extra cash. And so we really kind of looked at our different candidate population so that we could market to them. We also thought it was very important to showcase actual employees. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, the other themes that we landed on are family. Obviously, we all know Wendy's as a brand. Dave Thomas, the founder, we've all seen the commercials back in the day. You know, Wendy's was started as a family business. Wendy is his daughter. Uh, she actually owns a bunch of franchises. So family is very important to the organization. And diversity and inclusion is huge for them as well. Their workforce is primarily uh, African American and Hispanic. Uh, and, you know, even this year, they hired a chief diversity officer. They're putting a real emphasis on trying to recruit diverse talent within their uh, even corporate organization. So <clears throat> when we went to market with this campaign, we wanted to show real people. Um, we also, so we, we showcase actual employees as our real employees of Wendy's. Um, and we also needed it to tie to their consumer marketing. Um, their consumer to marketing, they have a tagline, we got you. And the whole theme of it is, you know, if you're playing Fortnite and you're a gamer, 
and you're hungry, well, we have DoorDash and we can deliver you a, you know, Baconator straight to your door. We get you, we got you, right? So we got your back. So our concept landed on real food, real people. If you want to keep it real, we got you. Um, so these are just some examples of the actual creative. So we came out with this new creative concept, this new brand. Now, again, you can do this on, on, a, on a smaller level. So, and I'm gonna, I'll keep talking you through that as we go through these slides, but we really wanted to get, um, they didn't have an employer brand. And so this is where we landed in terms of the, the fun creative concept. Yeah, for sure. And just as a side note on that, I just wanted to mention that um, there's a, a magazine called Office Vibe. I don't know if you've ever, or it's not a magazine, it's online, <laughs> but um, it's called Office Vibe. And they said that the, if you invest in your employer brand, you can see up to a 28% reduction of employee turnover. So um, just, just know that there are bottom line results in investing in an employer brand and making sure that the messaging that you're putting out there is, um, you know, is authentic. So then the next piece of this was the candidate experience. Um, and I find this a lot and for all the years I've been doing this. Um, the first place candidates are gonna go is to your website, especially in this day and age. I hear so many recruiters say, well, if I can get a candidate on the phone and I can sell them on my company, you know, then I can get them through the door and, you know, but think about this day and age, right? How hard is it to get somebody on the phone? right? Robocallers, who answers their phone these days if you don't know who, who's calling? And so the first thing that we tackled was the website. Now, if you don't have a budget to do a brand new, beautiful website, there are things you can do to your website to give it a facelift that, you know, don't cost a lot of money. But this, I just wanted to show you the before and after. Uh, the website they had was 10 years old. It was built by a, a IT guy who had left the company. It was hard coded, so they couldn't even go in and make updates. You know, it had some basic information. It was, um, but it felt like an online brochure. It didn't really sell the experience. The, the worst thing about the site was the job search. So when candidates would go in to look for a job, you know, sometimes the jobs wouldn't even show up. And so, um, you know, that was something we needed to fix immediately. So I would encourage you all to, to pretend you're a candidate, go to your company website and pretend you're applying for a job. And um, I think you'll find some big discoveries in terms of that experience because you spend a lot of money trying to drive people to your website. And I guarantee you the candidate drop-off is probably high unless you have a really good experience uh, once they get to the site. The other problem with the site was the franchise operations were not posting their jobs to the site because it was hard to use. And so um, that was a big piece in, in making uh, our campaign successful. So this is one of the things that we think all companies should focus on right now is enhancing that candidate experience. Um, the, the site, uh, before we, we built the new site, it was not mobile friendly. I don't care if you're in an hourly workforce, if you're a professional, we live on our phones, right? Or our tablets. And so you've got to make sure that your website is mobile friendly, that it the, it's responsive, that it adapts to whatever uh, device that you're using, because there's a good chance that they're going to look at your site from your mobile their mobile phone. We made sure that the, the site was organized in a way that you could always look find a job. At any point in the website, if you were ready to go look for a job and apply, that call to action follows you throughout the site. But we also had a lot of good content in the site. And we, we did a lot of storytelling through the use of video. So, you know, if I'm going to look for, you know, an hourly job and I want to go work in a restaurant, we have a whole page on restaurant life. And we have videos of actual employees talking about, you know, why it feels like you're a part of a family at Wendy's, the flexibility, the career growth, right? And so we, we made sure that the site was really rich in terms of the content um, for the candidate. We also built a tool that the franchises could use to post their jobs to the site and, and their hiring events to the site. So we made it really easy for the franchises as well. And we also implemented technology, which I'm going to talk about in a minute to improve the candidate experience. The other advice I would give you around the website, talk to your marketing department, 
it probably sits on a platform that has like Google Analytics or Adobe that you can actually go in and see uh, there's data right that you can look at to say where are candidates going in my website what content are they consuming where is the drop off so if you see that they come into the home page and then they go to your job search and then they leave you know you have an issue so sometimes you can use that data to build a case study uh, to get your marketing department or uh, you know find funds to build a new website if you do not have the funds to build a new website, there are a lot of things that you can do to improve that. Um, Megan had mentioned uh, job descriptions before. Make sure your job descriptions don't read like a textbook, right? Nobody reads anymore. We are all ADD, right? We've got our phones. Our, there's so much media coming at us all day long. Uh, I would highly recommend you look at those job descriptions. And even in your job descriptions, make them short and sweet. And if your company says, I've got to have all this legalese in my job description, well, in the very beginning, you know, put the what's in it for me, sell your organization, because if you don't do that in the beginning, you will lose that candidate. Um, update the photography, right, to keep it fresh, um, right, add some new content. When you look at job seekers today, you know, we're in a pandemic. The things that people are worried about is safety. Right, so with Wendy's, we had a whole section that talked about what they were doing to keep their, their crew safe, all the things that they put into place. We have a lot of working mothers who have left the workforce, right, because their kids were not in school, right? And so talk about the flexibility, talk about your 401k, your benefits, right? The things that are important to candidates now <clears throat> as they're deciding to uh, join, get back into the workforce. Um, and so that would be the advice I'd give to you on that piece. With the invest in TA technology, um, one of the keys uh, as well as we really wanted to shorten the apply process. Um, you know, I know um, a lot of times, especially when you're working in manufacturing or, or so forth, you rely on, uh, you know, the recruiters may lot rely on the people working in the warehouse to call the candidate and set up the interview and right and there's just this whole lag uh, in from the time that they apply to the time that they even get a phone call. And so we implemented this technology. It's a technology called Paradox. There's a lot of other vendors in the space, um, but Paradox, we went through a whole vendor assessment uh, and, and they were the best fit for Wendy's. But what this is, and you can see this here, it's a chat bot. Um, you know, candidates, we all use assistive technology today. We talk to our phones, we ask Google to give us directions someplace. We ask Alexa what the weather is, right? We're all used to using that now. So if you have a candidate who's interested in you, but not ready to call you or apply, this chat bot acts as an assistive uh, it, it's assistive technology. So they can go in and ask, who's your CEO? What kind of benefits do you have? It's multilingual. Um, once they do start to apply for the job, they don't go into an ATS. This chatbot, which we even, Quinn, they, uh, it's through Paradox, but we, we created an avatar, which is that little blue guy at the top. Um, but it actually screens you. So it will ask you the basic screening, screening questions. Are you over 18? What shifts are you looking for, right? It asks some basic questions, screens that candidate. If they answer all the questions in the way uh, that they screen in, it will actually give them the opportunity to schedule an interview. The field will love this because all the, the hiring managers do is they block time in their calendar, right? So it automatically will set up interview times for that candidate. So again, it reduces that... Um, time for the field in terms of the administration it makes the experience good for the candidate and we reduced their app to hire it, they used to have to get eight applications to make one hire uh, we're down to three applications to a hire so the investment has paid for itself we even have it tied into their back end to leo it initiates the background checks um, so again this is a really good tool uh, for people who are looking for a um, technology to help improve that process. If you don't have the budget to do something like this, it, at a minimum, look at a texting uh, option. There's a lot of vendors out there who do that at, at a low cost. Uh, communicate with the candidates the way in the way that they want to be communicated with.
For sure. And those texting um, types of technologies, it's not like you have to have your phone out and be texting with them. It's, it's you know, it's, it, it works on your computer and you can, um, you know, text back in real time with, with candidates. So that is a, a really great option. And one thing, another another thought around the candidate experience and shortening that apply time um, AppCast there uh, is a is a technology company in our arena and they came uh, they do a lot of um, uh, metrics and, and so forth and they said if your application is 15 minutes today and you can get your application down to five minutes that you'll increase your pipeline by 350 percent so really keep in mind, and Christina suggested going on and trying to apply for a job. There are so many questions in those applications that aren't super critical in order to get somebody in the door for an interview. So if you can take those out or at least have it be a phase two for an application, that, that would be a really successful way of increasing your pipeline. As Christina said, Everybody now has a short attention span. I think they likened Americans now to, a, I, I want to say, a four-second. Uh, so, so it's like equivalent to a fly of, of um, you know, keeping keeping your attention. So, so just think about that when you're looking at your apply process from a 360-degree point of view. Christina, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I think you froze okay. right there. <laughs> okay, can, can everyone hear me? I'm not frozen, right? Okay. <clears throat> and then finally- um, There you modern, are, okay. Yeah. I'll let you go. Uh, and then finally, modernize your recruitment marketing strategy. I think Megan had touched on this before. You know, in the old days, you could post a job on Monster, Career Builder, you get Indeed, you get a ton of applications. Um, you know, obviously you want to be on Indeed and, and, and those job boards, but don't solely rely on those. Cast a wider net, right, to get in front of both passive and active job seekers. For a lot of our clients, we do what we call pay-per-click. It requires no contract, so you're not locked in uh, uh, for a year or two years. Um, you can pause at any time. So if you start a campaign and it's not giving you the results that you're looking for, you can stop and take that remaining budget and reallocate it to a different um, approach. <clears throat> there's, an op there's the ability to optimize these types of campaigns. Um, Google SEM, right? We all start our searches on Google. I think I've, I've seen stats from anywhere from 80% to 90% of all searches start on Google. And so you can buy keywords on Google. And so with the example I have here on the left, we did, we, and we still do, a huge marketing campaign uh, to drive applications. And, um, you know, with Google SEM, you can buy competitor keywords. So, you know, if I'm uh, American Family Insurance and I want to target my competition uh, and I, you know, combined insurance or, you know, whoever my competition is, you can buy those keywords and bid on them. So if someone types in, you know, jobs at combined insurance or, or even buy your own keywords, jobs at American Family Insurance, because you're, I guarantee you, your competitors are bidding on your company name. So for Wendy's, we, we do a huge campaign nationwide. Uh, we bid on keywords like, you know, fast food jobs, restaurant jobs, jobs near me. So we look at general terms. We look at food service terms. We also bid on their competitors. So McDonald's jobs near me and so forth. And we are constantly looking at the data and optimizing so that they get the best return on investment. And many times the cost per application comes in lower than the traditional job board. Uh, so it's very, that's a very powerful tool as well. Go out on social media, right? Go where your, your candidates are, you know, especially when you look at the younger generations, they live on Snapchat, they live on Instagram, they live on TikTok, right? Go where they are spending their time. So, you know, with Snapchat, you can do some really fun interactive ads when you're going for that younger audience. Um, again, it's all pay-per-click, uh, same with Facebook, right? The targeting is not as good on like a Facebook. Um, it's more general interest, but obviously there's a lot of people living on Facebook. So it's, it, you're, it's a captive audience. 
everything you do track measure and optimize um you know we we are not of the mindset of set it and forget it place the ad hope it works um you know constantly look at your data work with your marketing team they probably have this expertise if you don't have an agency uh or you don't have this capability yourself um but work with your marketing team to help implement some of these strategies and to really look at that data so that when you are making uh, your investments, you're investing it in, in the media that's going to get you your best ROI. And that is our presentation. <laughs> so we want to open it up for any questions. Um, any other topics anybody wants to talk about while you have us? Christina, what have you seen people do, or Megan, with transferable skills? Like you mentioned, Wendy's is starting to look at other competitors like Walmart, Target, that they didn't think about before. How have companies made some of those transferable skills happen? And can you give us some examples of how they've done that? Yeah, it looks like Christina. Oh, are you, are you good? Okay, I, I will go with that. Um, yeah, so so growing talent right now is a huge way to um, sort of increase your internal pipeline for um, uh, you know, for candidates. So for uh, so looking at transferable skills, not only outside of the organization, but also inside of the organization, right? So growing talent internally and making considerations for people externally. I mean, with with like for an example amazon amazon is gobbling up people from every industry right so um cnas from healthcare um you know people from quick serve restaurants um you know people who are you know making 50 oh megan you froze <laughs> all right you're back oh boy i'm sorry that's so that's so crazy i apologize um, but just talking about transferable skills and making sure that you are looking at a, the full candidate and what their potential is and how those transferable skills might fit into jobs that you didn't consider before. Um, like, for example, with insurance, I know that a lot of um, like insurance brokers and, and different types of, um, you know, sort of um, more entry level, but typically college educated folks maybe they don't necessarily need that college degree. And how can we find people who are just hungry for the job and can be trained? So there are definitely a lot of ways we can sort of mine other industries um, to find people who will work in the organization. Well, and what's interesting too is a lot because of COVID and the pandemic, a lot of people have left certain industries. So if you look at any of the data, AppCast just came out with a, with a, uh, uh, their recent report, so many people have left retail and the restaurant industry. And there are, uh, you know, you want to talk about career changers. I've never seen a market like this before. So you have a lot of people who are looking to move into different industries. So the way that you market to those people, you have to speak to them specifically, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're looking for people, you know, for Wendy's example, they are looking at like for their general managers, they have done an analysis to say, okay, what, what is the type of talent we need based on skills, not based on experience. And so, you know, they're looking at their compensation. We're looking at, um, you know, building out content on the website that speaks to those career changers. The way that we market to people is going to be different, right? When we advertise, we're going to speak specifically to those types of people that maybe weren't in the industry, uh, but who uh, could be good for the industry. We also look at, you know, um, different groups like military, right? Uh, you know, you hear a lot of people talking about people getting out of the military. Well, a lot of those people don't know where they fit in right, in the corporate America. So uh, the way that you message to them, market to them, source them is very different. So you have to be very strategic. And that's where we work with our clients to really put together a strategy that's not just like marketing. It's like, you know, 
what you know what is the messaging how are we going to uh put content on the website that speaks to them and then where do we go to find them and and, and what do we message to them in terms of what are the benefits and of the career change but a lot of companies are looking at you know specific skills not ex not experience within the industry and a lot of For people sure. are changing careers right now Right. And a lot of personality matching and training up people, right? So the training part of it is going to be huge. The people leaving the restaurant industry are, you know, going in droves to nine to five jobs, right? Like regular work from home style jobs and being able to offer that training internally to, to train those people up is a huge part of it. Um, and with military, one of the really great things um, there, at Google has a military service code translator. So if, if you get a resume from somebody in the military and they have their service code on there, you can type it in and see actually exactly what they did so that you're able to see what their skills are and how it might match with you. So that's something that you can consider doing. We have a question that came through the chat. It says, what can an organization that specializes in digital marketing, how can they specifically find talent? So it sounds like this person's struggling to find those specific skills to bring to their organization. Hmm. <laughs> can you expand oh, no. on that a little bit? So wait, so it's a digital media. It sounds like it's a digital marketing firm and they're struggling to find specific talent in the marketing world to bring them on, like candidates. Yeah, yeah. it's competitive right now. <laughs> uh, we, what I can even tell you at Shaker, we're higher, we've grown uh, through this pandemic and, and uh, it's very competitive right now. Um, you know, do you do, I, I mean, what about college recruiting? Do you, do you um, reach out to universities um, in the area? That might be something that you would want to consider doing, um, putting out some digital ads, Facebook, um, you know, LinkedIn. Even Snapchat, TikTok, those can be really great places to get to get younger talent. Yeah, I think um, most of us are on LinkedIn in some way, shape, or form, whether we have a, a filled out profile or not, right? That's updated. But um, I'd say LinkedIn is a big source. Um, there's a lot of freelancers out there right now. So if you're struggling to find full-time talent that wants to join your agency. Uh, there are a lot of talented freelancers and they're typically not super expensive. Uh, a lot of them come from the agency world. Most of them do actually and decide to go off on their own because they can make a living freelancing. So if you're really struggling to find people to hire full time, I would look at the freelance route. Um, and the other thing, too, is, I, you know, a lot of companies look for all this experience. Sometimes I think we overlook the the new high, the new grad, right? They've got the latest design skills. They know how to design for the web, uh, right? They know the Snapchat experience. They they live it, right? It's a part of their world. So you know, I wouldn't be afraid to kind of look at that young talent um, when you're talking about digital as well. But if you're really struggling to hire people within your organization, I would potentially look at the freelance route. Because the other thing with that is if you get a couple of really good freelancers and they really like your organization, many times you can turn them into a, into a permanent employee. And the only problem with um, what we're having with now is we have a specific um, type of atmosphere. Um, of course, before the pandemic, it was absolutely no remote. Now, you know, we're kind of forced into remote, but we don't offshore. Um, we, uh, we don't hire people um, as contractors. Uh, we've gone to like NIU, you know, places like that. But, you know, we're looking for people with ex actual experience because, you know, in this field, you have to hit the ground running. Yeah. And Denise, are you talking around like uh, media buying, or are you talking more around like creative type of people? Um, creative, um, you know, they also have to have that tech background. Um, they have to have the marketing background. Uh, they have to know uh, the back end of uh, Facebook, um, LinkedIn, and you know, I would love to advertise on LinkedIn, but the problem is, is that it's very expensive. 
you know, we're talking over 10 grand. Yeah. Well, I will tell you, there are also resources out there. Um, we work really closely with a company called Velocity and they're not headhunters. They're not search. Uh, they're more lead generation. So you can pay. And, and I think for one search, it's five or 6,000. So it's not cheap. But if you're looking for a handful of a certain type of person, I mean, they, they have access to all these different databases. They will uh, source all, these, all this talent for you. They'll even call them and contact them to see if they're interested and kind of hand you these leads. Um, so that could be uh, another way that you could try to source those types of people. I, I can send you information if you, if you want. Um, and Christina, that seems to be like the new hot thing is the data mining in order to find talent. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit more about that because everybody might not be familiar. Yeah. So companies like Velocity, so they have a, uh, the two men that started it were actually executive recruiters at Motorola many, many years ago. And so they have a, uh, one of the partners is in Thailand and it's interesting. They have access to all these databases. And it's not just LinkedIn. I mean, it's almost like uh, credit agencies have, right? So they invest in all this access to all these databases. They've got access to all these social websites. And so they literally, you know, if you came to them and, and Katie, I think you and I talked about this, you know, everybody right now is looking for data scientists, right? There's, that's the purple squirrel. They're, they don't, you know, there's as many as people are looking for them, they don't exist, right? They're, this is a new role. Um, and so, you know, an organization like a velocity, you know, it, they have these sourcers who actually sit in Thailand. So when you go to bed, they're sourcing through all these databases and they have a platform. When you wake up, you get into this platform and they have all these candidates in there and you, you either like them or don't like them based on their experience. Then once you put your input, then they start calling them, um, so, you know, they work across all industries. They work across pharma. Um, we use them uh, for our own hiring uh, needs. Um, so it, that's a big thing. People don't want to pay for headhunters necessarily and pay a percentage of the salary because that gets very expensive. Um, so it's kind of an a inexpensive way to source uh, talent outside of like using a headhunter or a recruiter, but they are very busy. Their business is booming. So, Christina, the other thing that all of us are hearing from our executives is that we need to get more diversity in. So what recommendations or tips or tricks do you have if we're starting to build a strategy based on that? Yeah. So, and, and Megan, you might want to speak to yeah. this uh, around John Graham. We ourselves have invested. We have a gentleman named John Graham who was a client who's come over to Shaker um, it's, it's a hot topic and it's very important. Uh, it's very important in terms of, right. You need diverse talent because America is diverse, right? And if you want that fresh thinking and that different point of view, right, you need your corporate America to reflect, uh, your consumer base. Um, we really believe that it starts, it doesn't just, you know, in the old days, it was like, you'd have a picture of a, a woman and an African-American and Hispanic person, right? And that was your ad. And that's what people did to be called diverse. And then there's all these niche sites out there, which Katie knows about really, because uh, she, she's involved. That's what she does at AmFam. So there's all these niche sites that focus on diversity. Um, and, right. So you could go out and you could advertise on all these different niche sites uh, like historically black college, uh, HBCU, uh, professional diversity network. You know, I could go on and on. There's just a million of them. So, you know, a lot of companies will just have a strategy to advertise on all those sites. Right. They have profiles and try to attend networking events. But we're taking it one step further in that we really think organizations need to look at themselves as an organization and really understand, are you diverse? Because if you try to recruit diverse people and they come to your organization and they come in and they're like, oh, great, you know, um, right, this company, they, they speak the speak, but they don't walk the walk, they're going to quit. You're going to turn, they're going to turn over. 
So, you know, we really think it starts with understanding who you are as an organization. We're going through this exercise ourselves um, with the John Graham leading it, where, you know, we're going through bias think training. Uh, you know, our whole company just took this survey. It's really eye opening because we all have unconscious bias, right? We all kind of know it. But when you take this, when you go through this training and you get your results, you, it's, it, it's kind of mind blowing. Um, uh, and so we're, you know, it's about doing that work as an organization. So you really understand kind of where you're at and the work that you need to do to really deal with those unconscious biases and to really welcome that uh, diverse talent. So, you know, they're heard and they're in key leadership roles. Um, you know, a lot of big corporations, you don't have the diversity at the top. And so it's really doing that kind of hard homework as an organization and doing those surveys and going through that training and understanding who you are as an organization so that when you are going to market, you are being authentic, you are telling the story about who you are that is authentic. So when you are doing all those marketing plans and you are sourcing those people, when they come in, they don't turn over. Um, Megan? Did, did yeah, absolutely. Right? It's about yeah, it's about that cultural inclusivity, right? Like you want to make sure that you have that inclusive culture. I mean, I think about, you know, if I, if, you know, I walked into an organization that was 100% men and I was the only woman, how would I feel? Would I feel included in their culture? And so, you know, if, if they were open-minded and, and really great, you know, group, yeah, probably, but if they weren't, I would leave. So it's just about that inclusivity and really, um, you know, making sure that everyone in the organization is, um, you know, working to um, include everyone. So it really, it, it really is um, eye opening. I mean, it, it, getting your own bias, you at first, you're like, no way. And then you start <laughs> thinking about more and more. And you're like, yeah, I do actually have biases. It's really, it is a really eye opening, eye opening exercise, I'd recommend for everyone. But I would say too, that if you're gonna do the marketing, right? If you're gonna go join all those niche associations, make sure that your website, your own website really is robust in terms of what you're doing as an organization, you know, your, the, your affinity groups that you have internally, your employee resource groups, showcase them, tell those stories, have the employees tell those stories because, you know, corporations can say all they want, but most of us have a trust issue in some way, shape or form to say, oh yeah, they say all that, but tell those stories on your website from the people who are doing those jobs and who are working within your organization so that when that candidate goes to your website, which is probably the first place they're gonna go, or they go to your LinkedIn or they go to your glass door, that they feel like they get it and it's authentic and they can see themselves there that's going to help you attract that, that diverse talent. Um, because, you know, they're not going to go to an organization that just has the lip service. And if they do, they will leave, they will turn over. Right. And if you don't have employee resource groups, I, I would recommend starting there. I mean, that's a really, really great place to, um, you know, to, to start is creating those employee resource groups and really giving them the resources to, you know, to meet and grow and, um, you know, start, start leading in the organization. And I love that you ladies are bringing this up because it kind of connects to what we're doing in October for our chapter. So in October, oh, we're having a DEI strategy workshop that talks about the seven pillars of DEI and how you can bring that to your organization because you brought up really good points. A bias training doesn't cost a lot to do at your organization or building resource groups like you guys are talking about, that doesn't cost a lot too. The only thing it does cost is just time, right? Getting people involved in the effort. And again, those become your ambassadors. So again, helps us work out from a marketing standpoint as well. Um, so if you guys are interested in October 28th, 8 a.m. to 12, we're going to have a DEI strategy workshop. It has seven pillars. And then after the workshop takes place, we actually have a legal update that will talk about what you can do from a DEI lens, because there's a lot of people that are also worried from a legal standpoint. Well, if I'm starting to go after diversity groups, am I discriminating against groups that are not part of that diversity. So they're going to talk about that a little bit more. So I stuck it in the chat for everybody. If you are interested to click on the link and find out more information on it. 
we probably have time for one or two more questions. Is there anybody in the audience that wants to ask a question? All right, I guess the question I would ask you guys is, uh, if I have no budget for marketing, what are some of the maybe top three things that I can do so that I can start targeting talent that I'm looking for? Well, you just mentioned one of them, Katie, employee brand ambassadors. And that was, uh, I had it in the deck and I took it out because our deck was really long. Um, if you have no money, which a lot of companies don't have budget right now, everybody's being, uh, you know, tap into your current employees, right? Um, work with your marketing department create those social ambassadors uh employee you know candidates are more likely to join a company where they know somebody and so the way that you do that is you know a lot of times it's easy to tap your new hires right they're excited they're new to the company they want to tell everybody where they're working right or tap your um entry level people right they live on social they they, they have big networks you know 2,000 friends in their networks is not uncommon, 4,000, everybody they meet, they hit up on Snapchat, you know, tap into those groups uh, or identify some of your like key performers and, and put together a brand ambassador program. What you need to do for them is just really create some templates. So some social templates that they can use and you create a couple templates, you can work with your marketing department, you could have some that speak around the employee experience, events that you're having, job openings that you're having, um, and, and give them the templates with the content and have them push it out into their social networks. It doesn't cost any money. And you know, to create a couple templates is not expensive. You probably have that resource in house. And um, it does take some organization, it does take some time and effort, um, but there's no cost behind it because you're tapping into your, your uh, employees to be brand ambassadors. For sure, that, I mean, that's awesome. And also maybe even include a hashtag. So you could um, like, for example, we have one for PetSmart that's hashtag life at PetSmart. And so then you can aggregate all that content. Like you can search hashtag life at PetSmart and everybody who posts this stuff with that hashtag will come up and then you can repost that information or, or those different posts under yours. So you, you can, you know, sort of um, empower all of your employees to, to post and then you can pick the best things and put them, put them on your own um, social media. So social media is the most powerful for free tool. So I would say that that is, that is number one, creating employee resource groups, also taking a look at your application, making sure that it's leaner, it's easy. You can add stuff to your website, make sure things are um, authentic. So take down any of those, um, you know, the pictures that aren't your employees, right? So any stock photography that's on there, get rid of it, put real photography on there, like real people working there. Um, and um, I think that that's, those are probably like, to me, the best free things to do. Um, Christina, you have any other thoughts? Yeah, the only other thing I would say is maybe work with your IT department to make sure that your website is optimized for uh, search engine marketing through Google. Uh, uh, Google, there's a Google for jobs where they, it's free. It doesn't cost any money. They pull them from your website. So talk to your uh, IT department to make sure that you're optimized for Google for jobs. Facebook, you can post jobs for free on Facebook. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so use those types of resources. I know a lot of clients that do that. They get a lot of play from just posting jobs on Facebook for free. So that would be the other advice I'd give. Ladies, thank you so much for your time. If anybody wanted to get a hold of you, would you be okay either putting your emails in the chat or your LinkedIn? Yeah, absolutely. No problem. And then are you okay sharing the deck with everybody as well so that we can give them those resources as well? Yes. And Absolutely. Katie, should we just send it to you to? Yep, you can send okay. it directly to me. And okay. um, I'll get a recording out to everybody that attended today. And again, if you're interested in joining our next event, it's going to be a workshop that's at the end of October. I stuck the link in the chat. And again, thanks for everybody joining us today. Thank you, Megan and Christina and Kevin and Katie. We really appreciate your time. Have a yeah. great day, everyone. Bye, everyone. Awesome. Thank you.